Welcome, everyone. My name is Joy Fisher-Williams. Uh, I work in marketing for Lippincott. We are now known as Walters Kluwer. Uh, you probably know us as Lippincott, and we are a very proud publishing partner with AMSA and also a sponsor of the AMSA Education Research Fellow, and that is Rachel Glassford. So I'm going to hand it over to her, Rachel. Great. Thank you so much, Joy. We're so excited to have everyone here. Uh, and so we'll go ahead and get started with our speaker introduction. So Linda Costanzo has received an A.B. in chemistry from Duke University and a Ph.D. in pharmacology from the State University of New York. She's been on faculty in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at Virginia Commonwealth University, or VCU, since 1981. Dr. Costanzo has been heavily involved in medical school teaching as assistant dean for preclinical medical education, director of M1 Physiology and M2 Board Reviews, and as a member of the Executive Admissions Committee. She's authored numerous books for medical students, including DRS Physiology and Physiology Cases and Problems, and has been recognized for teaching by a variety of awards, including the first annual School of Medicine Teaching Excellence Award in 1999 and the Alpha Omega Alpha Robert J. Glazer Distinguished Teacher Award by the Association of American Medical Colleges in 2004. And so without further ado, we'll turn it over to our speaker. Great. And Linda, here is a photo of you oh. with someone special. <laughs> <laughs> do I have the I have the advancer now? Yeah. You do. Okay. I'm about to hand it right over to you. So everyone, uh I see people uh dial or responding in the chat box. I just want to speak briefly to some of their concerns, uh, Dr. Costanza. Uh, my biggest worry is there's so much information that I will get it all mixed up, especially during exams. <laughs> what worries me about physiology is not having free time because of the course load. Mm -hmm. Applying the concepts is difficult. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Yeah, I think you mentioned this earlier. I'm worried about focusing and memorizing and understanding the systems that I don't want to forget the human emotions involved in being a doctor. So mm -hmm. some really great comments. Okay, uh, I'm going to hand this to you, Dr. Costanza. Okay. See a little alert, and tell me when you're ready to advance the slides. And we'll do our first polling question also in the chat box, just so okay. you know. Okay. okay. Ah, this is me. Hi, everybody. I'm really glad to be here and so thrilled that um, uh, Walters Kluwer and AMSA invited me. I, physiology is my love. Well, it's actually my second love next to this little fellow here is my grandson Max and this is the picture we took over the holidays so I thought you you know he might enjoy his big smile he's not studying physiology that's why he's so happy right um, so I guess our first polling question just so I can get a little bit more background on you is could you tell us your year in medical school and you just have to click a few times for this one Linda I have to click a few times. Hit the arrow. You'll see the oh, choices. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. let us know, are you a first year or are you pre-med? First year, second year, third year, or pre-med? So far I'm seeing a bunch of first years. I see an MS2, a graduate, another MS2, a pre-med, another pre-med, Vina. Julian, Prima, or sorry, MS2, Evelyn is MS1. And Rachel says we're seeing lots of MS2s writing into the Q&A. Mm -hmm. okay. So there you go. Great, great. Well, it, I mean, it's, it's really nice to have such a diverse group, and I'll try to address uh, most of my comments that, you know, in, in a way that will be meaningful for all of you. Um, I think some of you who are MS2s are probably – uh, still taking your systems courses and getting ready for your step one, and hopefully some of the comments will be relevant for that too, because obviously physiology is a big part of, of step one. Um, this is me. I've been at VCU for 30-something years. Um, it's really exciting that VCU has become famous through its basketball team, so now um, people actually know where I am in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and um, I think the first the first question that came to mind for me that I thought might be your question also is why is physiology different? Uh, if you're if you're a pre-medical student, you may be taking um, a, an animal physiology course or a human physiology course in preparation for medical school. If you're in medical school, obviously it's one of the key basic science courses 
But I think a lot of a lot of students recognize um, that it is different. It's going to be learned differently, and they're both excited to start physiology. I hear that a lot, but also a little bit worried. Uh, I think the first the first reason it's different is that somehow the the stakes feel very high. Um, the physiology is the foundation for pathophysiology. You have to understand the physiology well in order to get the pathophysiology, and all of that is a, the basis for medicine. Um, so students sort of recognize that it's not just about the upcoming test, but it's really more for life. And uh, I think you feel kind of that, a little bit of that pressure. Uh, secondly, um, physiology cannot be memorized. And um, as good pre-medical students and medical students, you've become very good memorizers. And it's a very, you know, it's an adaptive skill um, that you've learned and you've gotten very good at it. And then you, you get the word uh, from the upperclassmen that you're not going to be able to memorize your way through physiology. There are certain things that, ha you know, fact-based fact things that you have to memorize, but a lot of it has to be really understood and applied. And that's both, you know, for a lot of students, that's very good news. Uh, I often hear students say they're kind of relieved to that because they are conceptual thinkers, and I also hear students say that they're worried about that part of it. Um, and then the last uh, big thing that kind of came to mind um, is, you know, the graphical equation calculation part of physiology. It, it's physiology. It, it's physics-based. Um, there's no getting around the math part of it. And, um, I, you know, I, I think um, try as hard as we can to make that part of it accessible and to make it intuitive, and that would actually be my recommendation to you, is to, you know, turn any graph or equation into something that um, you, can, you can think about in words or think about verbally if you're not naturally inclined that way. So I think that's the final thing that, that kind of makes it different. Um, in terms of a philosophy of, you know, how do you approach physiology? You just finished maybe your um, uh, anatomy course or, you know, every, every medical school has a different order of things, but um, the organ system physiology is going to generally come a little bit uh, later in the curriculum after you have the foundational stuff, um, anatomy and histology and biochemistry. Um, so in terms of an overall philosophy, I think, it, you know, sort of linking it to what I just said about, you know, why is it different, it's because you're really going to learn it for life. It's going to be the undergirding of everything that follows in medicine. Um, you really, you know, have to commit to understanding concepts and principles and, and to, to prioritize that over just memorizing isolated facts because you're not going to learn physiology if you're just a fact-based person. And, and I think the final thing, and some of you have actually touched on this in, in your questions, which are excellent, and I look forward to seeing more of them, is that um, you know, you're constantly sort of revising in your mind that hierarchy of the concepts and making the connections between the concepts and between organ systems and then you know, sort of tying together these recurring themes. And it's, um, sometimes I, when I talk to my students, I liken it to... Um, it's sort of circling the globe of your understanding of physiology, which is basically how does the body work. I mean, that's you know, pretty important stuff. And every time you make a pass through the material, um, you sort of re revise your understanding of what the connections are and how things relate to each other and what the themes are. And that just simply cannot be done in a single pass through physiology. It takes multiple, multiple passes. And yet you're as students, you're confronted with sort of knowing it well, you know, well enough in that first pass, and then maybe when you prepare for step for step one, you get another big pass through it. And but I think it's almost a lifelong process um, of constantly sort of revising your understanding. Um, so to the, some of the nuts and bolts, I think in terms of best practices in learning physiology, and if for those of you who are in a course now or about to begin a course in physiology or are in a, an organ system curriculum where there's a physiology component to each system, um, I think um, you want to think in terms of a rhythm or a cycle of preparation. And my strong bias, uh, and you can take it or leave it, this advice, but um, I would, you know, I really advise you to think about this, is that you start 
start pre-reading. And if you've tried pre-reading in the past and haven't really liked it or didn't find it was that useful, I would encourage you with physiology to try it again. Um, I think it, it, it may be more important for physiology than for some other subjects. And the purpose of pre-reading, which can be, you know, you pre-read the lecture notes, you can pre-read the PowerPoint slides, you can pre-read a book if you're using a didactic book um, to supplement you. Um, and what it does is it it really warms the circuits before class and primes your brain um, with some of the big points um, so that you get the gist of, um, you know, what the story's about before you go and attend the lecture or listen to the lecture. And that means you can go to class having pre-read um, with your head up, listening, um, anticipating difficult areas, and really learn in class. And that buys you time because if you're – Sitting in class completely confused, no idea what's going on, and saying to yourself, and I don't know if how many of you have had this experience, well, I'll just, oh, my gosh, I'm totally lost. I'll figure this out later. You've basically lost that hour of your life. Um, but if you've pre-read and you have a general idea of what's going on, um, not all the details, um, then class time can be learning time, and the goal would be to really, you know, follow point for point what the professor is saying, and that's time gained for you. Um, then in the afternoon, you review the material, um, do some practice questions, more about that later, and uh, repeat. And um, I would just encourage you to try this, especially the pre-reading. It's something that you have to you can get on the rhythm. It's not all or none. Do the best you can. Maybe limit the pre-read to even 15 or 20 minutes per lecture hour. That's it to give you per hour of lecture um, to give you an idea of how, uh, how much time you want to devote to something like this, um, just to get um, an overall view. Um, a lot of students, once they get on into that rhythm, find that uh, they really, there's no looking back. They, uh, it, it's very effective. Um, the question about books. Um, of course, I'm kind of a book person, so I'm trying not to let my bias show too much. But um, I would be curious whether you are a book person. You could just answer in the chat box, yes, no, sometimes. Um, and I'll, and uh, Rachel and uh, Joy are going to be kind of watching the responses as they come in, and I'll uh, try to keep an eye on it too. And um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about books and then what the value is and then be curious about what, what some of your practices are. Um, I think the the value of of using a book in physiology is that it's going to tell the same story that you're getting in in your lectures or in classes, but in a different voice. And somehow, um, I mean, the way the brain works, um, that can be very effective. Um, it can be very effective to to hear about um, the ionic basis of the action potential, pick something um, you know, that, uh, that's going to occur very early in your physiology course, or the autonomic nervous system. I saw somebody said that was one of their worries. Um, so you hear about that from your professor, and you get their organization of the ionic basis of the action potential or the autonomic physiology. Um, but then to, to read about that same subject um, from a book in a different voice um, from a slightly different perspective actually can be very good for the learning process. Um, I think the, the, the learning process is actually strengthened when you're sort of coming at things from possibly a little bit different angle. Um, and books, you know, what books are good at is providing, you know, a strong uh, order and hierarchy. They provide cohesion. Uh, they can tell a continuous story, which lectures often don't. They fill gaps for you where you just are, um, you know, com you know, have missed something and just didn't get it, and a book can often, often do that very concisely. And, of course, books are really good for spot help on difficult topics. So sort of all of those things um, you should be looking for in a book. Um, I think the question often is um, whether you want a reference book, um, which – or a didactic book or a review book, um, you know, and, and where, you know, what would be most helpful to you? I think reference books in general are going to add more detail and go beyond what you have in your classes. And for some students, especially, I think, um, students who, um, you know, um, graduate students or MD-PhD students, 
often want the reference books, and I, I particularly love the Boron and Bullpup Med medical physiology text that, uh, that uh, is published by Elsevier, and Byrne and Levy is very good, and those are uh, pretty, they're pretty substantial and very, very authoritative uh, physiology textbooks. I personally use them all the time um, to continue learning myself. Um, for didactic textbooks, um, which will have um, usually a friendlier tone, um, tell a story, um, not provide the level of detail that a reference text would, but to really um, teach pretty, you know, teach you via a book very much at the level probably of your classes. Um, um, the, uh, the book I wrote, the textbook I wrote for Elsevier, uh, there's also a book by uh, Rhodes, a medical physiology book that's published by Lippincott. So there are, um, a, you know, there are several options that you have. Um, review books are, I mean, you really have to be a little bit careful here. Um, review books are, um, especially in physiology, are really on, are going to be useful after you understand the topics. I personally don't think you should be learning your physiology from um, a review book, a, a, you know, a step one review book. Um, I think you, you, you need to learn it from your classes or from a didactic textbook or a reference textbook, you know, whatever your choice is, and then use the review book sort of at the end of a block to, um, for a quick review, to, you know, to verify that you're getting it, that you get the main points. And of course, that also is a transition for you to, to step one. So you may be using a review book that you can also then use again for your step one review. Um, and so that makes it a very efficient process. But I, I, you know, be careful about um, doing your primary learning from a review book. Um, and some students probably can get away with it, but I think for a lot of other students, there's just enough, not enough meat there. It's not intended to be used that way. Um, for the primary learning, so make sure you're very thorough. Um, uh, Dr. Costanzo, there, there are questions so far, and I could, you know, be happy to answer right now. Sure. Well, this is Joy, and I was just going to comment on the poll question that you asked about: Are you a book yeah. person? Actually, yeah. Rachel can speak to this too. I think we're seeing a, a pretty good mix. Uh, so you see people who are emphatically yes, and in some cases emphatically no, with an exclamation point. <laughs> uh, well, the people say. They have a concern. Uh, they, they they purchase the book, but they're concerned about being able to get to the content, especially prior to mm -hmm. class. Um, you know, obviously, some of you are probably more ebook users or online users than you might be print books. So that's another factor. Uh, anything else you noticed, Rachel? No, that's pretty, I pretty much saw the same thing in terms of the good spread. I saw a lot of people who were emphatically yes about using textbooks, and others that say sometimes. And this question popped up. And it says, my worry is the vast amount of information presented in the textbooks versus what I need to know for the step one exam. And I think that's pretty relevant to what you're talking about now, which is be cautious about the draw of just studying from a review book and really the importance of the reference book or the didactic book to learning first. Yeah. And I think for students who are um, really concerned about the, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> using a very large physiology text and concerned about the, the, the amount of material there and, and you know, so much in a, in, a, in a reference book would not be relevant probably for step one. Uh, that's not, you know, that probably wouldn't be the right match. Um, I think if you, have, if you really have that concern, that's not, the, you know, that's not the kind of book for you. You're probably going to be better off with a didactic book or just using your PowerPoints and notes and then using a review book kind of at the end of a block. Um, I think the time the time question is such an important one, and how do you how you devote your time? One one observation I've made is that as students progress from say the first year to the second year, they become much more independent in terms of deciding what resources they're going to use. And I think it's a natural evolution and maturation that occurs. And I don't know if some of the stu the participants here. Uh, would agree with that, but students become a lot, uh, a lot bolder about making their own choices about what they're going to learn from. And you start out as an M1, you're often just like, you know, tied to those PowerPoints. And if it says it in the PowerPoint, I'm going to somehow learn it. And by the time you're maybe second semester, first year, or or in, into the second year, you're making decisions on your own. That I'm going to, I'm going to um, pick some good resources. Some of them are going to be books. Some of them, you know, maybe online sources um, that work better for me. And, and I think that's the way it should be. I think you learn how to learn, and you learn what works for you. 
and um, you know, you probably your first your your first week of medical school uh, when you know in orientation when when uh, people were talking to you about um, how to study. They usually have a panel come in of upperclassmen and 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 stuff come in and advise you. Um, you'll hear uh, hear the upperclassmen say what uh, what you want to do is you learn how to study smarter. Uh, it's not about spending more time, but it's about using the time that you do spend more effectively, and that often can mean um, using a book to get you to the same place faster, more accurately, more efficiently, I guess I'm saying the same thing, faster and efficient, um, but more effectively. And so as you as sort of progress as a student, you learn how to do that, And because the material is the material. <laughs> And um, your goal at the end is to know it well. And so it's really about picking things that work for you. But I think when you first start medical school, you don't have quite the courage to, you know, to do all of that at once. It's something that will evolve. Um, I was going to say a word about case books. Um, cases are a great way to learn physiology because uh, they put phys the, the physiology in a clinical context, um, usually of these kind of made-up stories. Um, it's usually the format uh, is one that usually is some, you know, a case or a vignette followed by some questions and, and then explained answers um, that really teach you the physiology. And a lot of students get a big kick out of this. It's not, a, you know, of course it's something that is in addition to um, and all the other things you're doing and some students are not going to have time for it. But um, it's a really effective way to make the physiology, the, the, the most relevant physiology, which is what that's the most important part, um, to re make it really stick. And, you know, I see it in some of the questions that people are worried that, you know, just not going to be able to remember all this. Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the secrets to remembering the physiology is to have it hooked to something that you know really speaks to you as a future physician. It's like, well, when I when I read a case about a patient who had um, pulmonary fibrosis, and I saw what it did to the blood gases, and what the progression of the disease was, and how that if all that related to VQ mismatch and all this stuff, it just um, you know that's when it really stuck. Um, and um, so that might be for you. Um, should um, are there any other comments about books and stuff? I was going to talk about uh, writing and then uh, practice questions and taking tests were, were the next topic. So um, should I continue on? Um, sure. One, yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, one of the things uh, this is another little poll item, I guess, and it, um, we're curious about your writing practices when you study, uh, and this could be physiology or it could be just in general, um, so if you could answer in the chat box with just a, a, a word or two that would kind of, uh, you could pick from this list, uh, I don't write when I study, I highlight, I underline, I annotate in the margins, I copy the notes, I write a synopsis of main points, deep. any of those practices if you would write in the chat box if, you know, to share what your experience has been, I'd be curious. Yeah, and if you can just hit reply all, or uh, it says it gives you a choice to send a message. And if you say send to all participants, then we'll all see it. Uh, so I'm so far seeing annotate, copy. I sometimes write a synopsis. I write out my notes. I highlight. Highlighting and underlining is very popular. Yeah, good. <laughs> synopsis. Excellent. Excellent. That's right. So give me a shout. What you're seeing in the in the Q and A, if anything. Yeah. Notes and annotate, highlight and annotate, yeah, highlight and annotate. Right, notes and annotate. Yep, I'm seeing a lot of highlight and annotate in the Q&A. Oh, good, good, good. Well, um, are you highlighters and annotators? That's awesome. Uh, that's a very, very efficient way to write and to really, you know, anytime you can annotate sort of whatever your primary document is, whether it's a PowerPoint, you know, the PowerPoint presentation or margins of a – of a didactic book or you know whatever you're gonna that's a big efficiency move because then that document becomes sort of the the one that you carry forward and you know um, I um, I think the dilemma for some medical students is to write or not to write and um, 
I think in, in part because <clears throat> many of us from undergrad have um, developed a habit of doing a lot of rewriting, and um, it's a, it can be a hard habit to break. So the first uh, piece of advice, the first piece of advice I have on this subject is what you should not be writing when studying physiology. And I really strongly, strongly, strongly believe that you should not be copying the notes at this point. And um, I think, as I said, it's kind of a habit that can carry over from undergrad days um, that seem to work because you never did anything else, so you really don't know whether something else would have worked better. But you're, you know, there's this fear of letting go of a strategy that you have done for so long. And the problem with copying the notes and creating some new document that, you know, of your own notes that, you know, was just a rehash of, is that it's so passive and it eats up a lot of time. And that time can be used for a lot of things, you know, especially physiology where you learn, you need to learn and practice and repeat and practice and practice and practice. So it's just, it, you know, it's in part the time factor. It's just a, a it's a passive process and, you know, it's uh, one that you're not thinking at all. Um, so I, all, I urge all of my students whenever I talk to them about this that they need to kick the habit now if they are writers. But then students say, you know, I, saw, I need to write in order to learn. I need to have my finger, you know, my pen moving or my, you know, whatever um, keypad, you know, whatever the, the computer equivalent is. So I think um, I've thought a lot about this and what, you know, what kind of writing, which, you know, because I recognize that for a lot of us it's something about that motion or the physical activity of writing that keeps you engaged. And, and I think there are a lot of useful things you can write for physiology. So here's some ideas. Uh, what kind of writing that is active and would be useful. Um, and um, so the first piece of advice is that you don't start writing about a topic in physiology until you know something about it. So the, the, you know, the afternoon after the lecture when you're just sort of beginning to learn is probably a little bit too early to start making your own set of uh, study notes or study guide or whatever. It's much better to wait a little bit, maybe wait a couple of days, um, get a little bit more of the picture, that autonomic nervous system, maybe get that whole package, see what all the receptors do, what all the second messengers are involved, what, what their effects are on the organ systems, kind of get the whole picture, and then think about what would be useful to write. And there's, uh, you're going to be a little more sophisticated, and it's going to be a lot more useful. Um, what you write really depends on the topic. And so the, the question will be, for this topic, what kind of writing would be useful? Sometimes it's creating of something that's visual. It's often, I think, creating something that's visual, which means you know, make a list, um, make comparisons, make charts. Charts are wonderful because you have that comparative aspect. Um, sequence of events. Maybe you want to practice the neuromuscular junction and what the you know what the sequence of events is. See if you know you can write it without even looking at a book or your PowerPoint. Um, the other kind, you know, an, another thing that's very useful to write is something that's very synthetic, where you say, I'm going to make a sheet of all the major points about the fetal lung or all the major points about the adrenal cortical hormones. So every time, for example, let's take the fetal lung in your pulmonary physiology block, every time something relevant to the fetus pulmonary physiology comes up, you would put it on that sheet. So you would have fetal hemoglobin, you would have uh, surfactant, you would have hypoxic vasoconstriction. I'll think, I don't know if you've had, had this stuff yet, but it doesn't matter. You, you get the idea. These are a little bit, these are disparate topics, but they're all connected to the fetal pulmonary physiology. And guess where questions come from? They come, that's where multiple choice questions often come from. They come from the intersection of all the various you know, points. So when you create a synthetic sheet, a, you know, the synthesis, I guess I was calling it, um, then you're sort of anticipating where some good multiple choice questions might come. Um, writing, of course, for drill, where you practice writing a sequence from memory or practice redrawing graphs. If you've used those cardiac and vascular function curves, they're intersecting curves. Uh, really, the only way to learn that stuff is just to redraw the, the graphs and practice them and you know, and predict what the changes will be. And, of course, you know, writing equations from memory. There's all kinds of things you can do for drill. And, of course, the last kind of writing that is just so important is practice questions, which I'm going to talk about next. 
um, you know, doing good multiple choice questions and really um, simulating that testing experience is, is a good kind of writing. Um, so practice questions. Um, and this is in part the antidote to that issue of the graph equation calculation problem that some people think they have. And, you know, the only way to really address it in physiology is just to do it and just to do it where there are no stakes um, and make all your mistakes and get all the bad stuff out of your system. And um, you want to do lots and lots of questions. And the secret is to do them early and to do them often. Um, so, so many times students wait too long to do practice questions. They're waiting until they know it <laughs> and they wait till they're ready. And the problem is you're not going to be ready until too close to the exam and you will have missed an opportunity to learn from practice questions. So you really want to do them early before you think you're ready and use them in con use practice questions in a diagnostic way um, to determine where your issues are. Where, where are where are the gaps? Where, what are the things that you don't understand? And, and really learn both from the right answers and the wrong answers. So you'll be looking for, for practice questions that have multiple choice questions and explained answers. And you're going to milk those questions where you really, really learn from those explanations. And um, by the PS, um, learning from the right and wrong answers is going to be a little different than actual test taking where we're not going to pay attention to the wrong answers. But when you're practicing multiple choice questions, you do pay attention to the wrong answers because you can learn a lot from them. Um, sources for um, good multiple choice questions, any self-assessments that are provided in your course, hopefully with explained answers, BRS physiology at the end of chapter, uh, questions. There's also a comprehensive exam at the end on all of physiology or pretest physiology is another source of questions. And I forgot to put on the slide UWorld. USMLE World, which is the uh, online question bank that's, that's really terrific. And uh, all of you, uh, I think all of you will get that at some point, probably around your second year, and uh, do um, a, lot of good, a lot of good physiology in there. Um, another quiz, another um, poll we'd like to do um, to, to, uh, to take us to the final section of the formal presentation, and that is uh, test taking, actual test taking. And I, uh, the options here, and if you could answer with a word or two in the chat box, what happens when you take a multiple choice exam? What has been your experience? Have you had any bad experiences? Have you misread quest a question stem ever? Have you mentally reversed increase and decrease in the question stem, there, therefore answering the wrong question? Have you ever overthought a question? Have you ever panicked and not been able to think at all? Have you ever changed a correct answer to an incorrect answer? So I would be curious in the in the <laughs> chat box what experiences you've had. <laughs> Looks like we've got people saying that they misread the question stem, overthink a question, and a couple people who have said all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> I knew all of the above would have been the preferred choice. <laughs> I thought it might be. Looks like quite a few are saying overthink a question, though, in the chat in the Q&A. Yes, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. OK, thanks, Joyce. Oh, you're a note. Oh, so sure. a lot of people have done all of these things. So the last thing is, of course, these are things that, that um, the reason I came up with these choices, that these are all the things that real students do all the time taking tests, and it's so frustrating. It's, um, I think you're, you're more susceptible to some of these things in physiology testing because of the more complex application of knowledge and the stepwise thinking that's required. And I saw some of you commented on the two and three step questions, and that would be, you know, physiology is very much amenable to that. So good test taking in physiology, and these are, these are good testing practices, um, all, the, you know, all determined from real students uh, who have been through this. Uh, the first thing is you've got to read the STEM carefully and, and um, either underline if it's a paper exam or highlight if it's an online exam, un underline the critical words like increase or decrease. The number one test taking problem in physiology is not answering the question that was asked, believe it or not. Um, that is the most common thing. You answer something else. You miss the word because and therefore answered a different question. Uh, second thing is clearly identify the topic of the question and find that topic in your brain. 
every question has a topic. If it's a good multiple choice question in physiology, it has a topic. Uh, fetal pulmonary physiology, uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction, um, autonomic control of the heart. You know, I mean, every subject, every question has a topic. And so what you want to do is go in your brain to that topic, where that topic is stored in that globe of physiology understanding and get to the right place in your brain, not some other place. Um, the, you know, one of the best practices, and you've probably heard this before, but try to implement it, is that you cover up the answer choices while you're working the question. Don't look at the distractors, um, but work the question out slowly, thinking through the steps correctly. And then write um, any main thinking steps in the margin. Um, this, you know, with an arrow up or an arrow down, write your thinking steps because it's writing it down protects you from making some, you know, inadvertently making a change in your mind in, when it's just out there in the air um, from increases to decreases, which would completely screw up your taking of that question. Um, and then once you've done your own thinking, match your thinking with the, the choices and select the best answer. Um, it's the, the directions for multiple choice questions are um, select the single best answer. Best means best. It doesn't mean second best um, or also might be a possible answer. It's what is the best answer. Um, when taking physiology questions, your first shot is your best shot. So work each question slowly enough to be accurate. Um, you have to do that. Um, doing um, physiology questions twice fast is going to be twice wrong. Um, you've got to be slow enough to be accurate. Um, be really careful about the distractors. That's what the, the wrong answers are called. They're there to, it's a really wicked term, distractors. Uh, they're there to confuse you. Um, and um, some of them can, you know, look pretty good. But if you've done your thinking correctly and matched up your answer with the answer choices and picked the single best answer, then you really should move on and not try to look at all those distractors and try to somehow turn them into right answers by thinking 12 steps down the line. It's, um, you know, you're going to get yourself in trouble that way. And that's sort of related to overthinking. Um, once you find single best answer, you stop there and you move on. Um, and then, of course, you know this, but it's a, it's a hard habit to break. You don't change answers impulsively. If it's a physiology question and you're going to change the answer, you need to work the question again from scratch and take just as much time as you did the first time. You can't. The impulsive change is almost always going to be um, not be a good not be good. Um, and of course, get sleep the night before because um, you really can't think well if your brain is not rested. So that's the end of the formal presentation, and love any further questions that you all have um, for me. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I know that we will get uh, questions pouring in as we have throughout the presentation. Uh, one of the questions that we had that I think would be great to go back to, you talked about breaking this habit of just writing, writing, writing their notes. And then someone wrote in to say that they're preferring to use their textbooks over and over again and making their own self notes versus using the review text. But could you talk a little bit more in detail about how someone should transition from the rewriting and rewriting their own notes to practicing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean one I mean one of the best um I think steps in making that transition, and I, I work with a lot of students who are terrified of making this change, um, but then they really have to because they don't have enough time to do to do everything. The, the classic, sorry for going on about this, but the classic scenario is they uh, read, rewrite all these notes and never actually look at them because they ran out of time, you know, so it was a complete mm -hmm. waste. Um, so the tra I think that one of the keys in the transition is to waiting a couple of days before you write anything. <laughs> And then make your decisions on what you're going to write and what what kind of writing would suit, a, you know, each topic. And each topic is going to kind of, you know, dictate what might be useful. Um, often, if you wait a couple of days um, for some topics, uh, nothing at all should be written because you already got it, and there's really nothing more you need to do. Um, so uh, sometimes just that uh, that waiting period can actually be very effective. And then you're thinking more about, okay, what would be helpful? You know, would it be a chart? Um, you know, you're studying. Uh, I was going to pick up an uh, example from micro. That's not good. Um, 
endocrine physiology, mm -hmm. endocrine physiology. I mean, one of the incredibly good things to do for endocrine is to make a sheet on each endocrine system. Y'all can write this, make, make a note, note to self, do this when you get to your endocrine, um, where it would be a single sheet on each um, system, and you'd start with the synthesis if, um, there, if it's relevant, and that you could actually copy from a book and just slap on there. Um, second, the feedback regulation, and third, the actions of the hormone, and fourth, the pathophysiology, what happens if you have too much or too little of the hormone. I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing that's really useful and that you would, you know, then could study from for your exam. But you're not going to, you know, you're going to do that after a few days. Um, so I don't know if, that's, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. I think it certainly answered their question. The next question that we have uh, coming in, if we could go back to slide 11 where you talked about reference books and didactic books, could you talk a little bit more about finding the right didactic reading uh, and which one you suggest certainly? Uh, oh, um, well, of, um, of the reference books or the didactic books? Didactic books. Yeah, I mean, the best way is to ask um, the upper class and what they used. Um, because, if, if, yeah, honestly, I mean, um, you know, the word sort of spreads as to what was helpful and what was at the right level. Um, and um, it, as you become that more independent student where you're kind of deciding sometimes, you know, to use something that wasn't the book recommended for your class, um, but that students at your school seem to really find helpful. That's all. I mean, I'm just I'm being quite honest about this. I think that's one of the best sources of information. Um, in terms of a of a reference textbook, I think um, I mean really the, the the gold standard is the Boron and Bullpep uh, Medical Physiology. So was that what you were getting at, uh, or the question? Yep. The question I was getting at. Okay. I believe so. Yeah, the question was, which physiology textbook do you suggest for didactic reading? I think well, that covered that. I mean, I think <laughs> I'm sort of biased because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but then, mm. you know, I'm not. I mean, I shouldn't be the only one to you know to say that. So I. I, I I just notice our students, you know, and 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 I've heard students at other schools, you know, they they really rely on those upperclassmen who have been there and done that. And yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I have a question, uh, Dr. Costanzo. This is Joy. Um, a question that came up earlier, or a concern actually, when we were asking students what their biggest, you know, sort of fears or anxieties were around physiology, was this notion of having so much information to process and to learn that you might lose sight of the human side uh, of doctoring mm -hmm. or, you know, future doctoring. Yeah. How do you how do you suggest keeping that all in sort of perspective? Yeah. Well, I I think at, um I don't know if that was a pre med a med, pre medical student or a medical student who asked, but I think if um most medical schools um you know, the introduction to clinical medicine or practice of clinical medicine course they're going to have in their first and second year. Um, what's really cool is that um, once you start, um, you know, going to those small groups where you're learning the physical exam and history taking and so forth, and then we're probably going out and, and working with a community preceptor as part of that course, you will start to see physiology everywhere. And, the, you know, one of the nicest I think neatest experiences of the first two years is when you're, you know, the patients that you see out with your preceptor or whatever the format is, um, you know, have uh, a pathophysiology that you can actually understand because you've had the physiology course and you can now really talk to your preceptor about what they have. And, um, and seeing that in action, I think, puts that human aspect back in. Um, and I don't know, you know, that's something that works for many students or is relevant for many students. Um, but I know a lot of students struggle with that in the basic science years. You know, I'm, I'm aware of that. And I think um, learning through cases is another way, as, you know, I was talking about, you know, maybe getting a case book. That can be helpful, too. Um, and then sort of the longer-term vision that if you're going to be, 
you're going to be a good physician, you're going to be the best physician to your future patients, you really have to know the physiology well, um, it, you know, and that makes that's going to ultimately make you um, a capable and, you know, um, a capable physician to serve Great. your patients. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for answering it in detail. I, I think I want to share something that looks like it didn't go to everyone, but Mackenzie was saying uh, advice that she got was to take the lecture notes, read one slide at a time, and attempt to explain them in her uh-huh. own words as if she were actually conveying that information to a child. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. To a child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean but that's, a, that's really great, Mackenzie, because, um, you know, it's something I hadn't really um, thought of in putting this together is, you know, the opportunity to, teach it to each other or, you know, to a mirror or pretend there's a, you know, a child who doesn't know anything about it, whatever your format is, is, is a great way to, um, to, to learn it um, when you have to explain it. Um, and the only pitfall, the only pitfall I see in, um, you know, in, in, in a lot of, what I'm sort of jumping to group work, but it's sort of, you, te- you know, where you teach each other or you explain to each other, you have a whiteboard and you're, you know, talking through, is that if, if, you're, if the members of the group are not quite, you know, there yet in terms of their understanding, it's easy to, it's easy to get off the track and, and um, you know, teach things incorrectly to each other. Um, so it's just something to be careful about, and I think you can employ enough checks and balances in your in your teaching each other that you know that that won't happen. But just something to look out for. But it, of course, you know, having to explain something is just the ultimate in in learning it yourself. Sure. And Rachel, I'm just chiming in here because I'm not sure you're seeing all the questions that are coming through to me. Mm-hmm. Um, one, uh, Brian says, I'm a physiology major. Would that give me an advantage for medical school in terms of difficulty? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're a physiology major, it sound, sounds like it was going to be um, very advantageous. Um, so I would, you know, encourage you, Brian, to, you know, um, take it to the next level and, um, you know, do just do awesomely in medical school physiology because you're going to have, you know, um, a little better foundation than others coming in. So um, it means that you can, you know, really, you know, we talk about, pa- you know, how many passes you really have to make with the material um, to really learn physiology, and you're going to have a little bit of a head start on that, which is great. Excellent. Rachel, are you seeing some others? Well, I did get a question in the Q&A that's asking for your opinion I'm Dr. Costanza about Kaplan's Q-Bank in comparison to UWorld, or if you have a thought and opinion on any of the Q-Banks that are out there. Uh huh. Yeah, I think UWorld is superior to all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I don't have any affiliation with them. It's uh, they they do a great job with the multi-step thinking questions. Um, so I, I mean, I'll just say I'm saying the same thing. I tell my own students and advising them for for um, step one. Mm-hmm. And, and really is to do uh to do that first and to, to actually do to do two passes in new world um before step one. So that means probably you know, starting it during your second year. Uh and there's some other Great. good banks there's some other um um pretty good banks out there, but you know, since you're gonna be spending time it's always a matter of okay, where are you getting the most value? And I think I think because UWorld does such a good job with the multi-step thinking, and their explanations are are quite good and not too long. Um, um, really like it. Great. I think uh, Rachel, I see, I see, I see. Sure, one more. Uh, and yeah. Wrap it up. Uh, and this one's from Jay, and you probably, I think you're both, we're both seeing this, so I'll just sort of ask it for Dr. Costanza. Um, Jay is asking, can you give us some more suggestions on how to use practice questions? For board prep, specifically, how would you recommend balancing the time between questions and study and review time? Mm. For uh, during the the second year or during the crunch month, do you think? Ah, well, he did not specify. He just said generally during board prep. He said second year. Okay, thanks, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think you need to be practicing questions um, all year, second year, you know, um, 
doing good multiple choice questions, adding in the U World resource with your systems courses or however however second year is presented. Um, it you know it's students r routinely tell me that their grades improved when they started doing sort of an outside source of review questions. It, it, again, that it's that idea that if you learned it a certain way, and then if you do a question that kind of comes at the subject matter, matter obliquely, it, that you know, it sort of you, you think that would be the opposite, that you it wouldn't be as relevant. But in fact, the the way the brain works, that actually is more effective. And so, doing an outside source of questions, Robin's review of pathology is another really good question book just for pathology. Um, and then during Crunch Month, I don't know. I mean, it's probably you know, re review books is probably two-thirds of the time, quest practice questions maybe one-third of the study time, something like that. It's unfortunate that you can't do everything through practice questions <laughs> because a lot of students would, would favor that. It's just much more fun. But um, I don't think practice questions could ever be as efficient or comprehensive as just going through, you know, review books and, and first aid. Um, so a balance between the two is probably best. All right. Well, uh, as hopefully everyone can see, I, I jumped us ahead there to the last slide uh, in the interest of all of your time so that you can get back to that studying. <laughs> uh, so I want to give uh, Rachel and Dr. Costanzo a chance for, for the last word, but I just wanted to say uh, on behalf of Lippincott and Walter Sluer, thank you so much, everybody, for joining this call and for the really great questions. And I think, Rachel, you'll speak to a little bit about how we'll circulate the webinar slides afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. And just again, thank you so much. This is our second webinar like this uh, that Lippincott and AMSA's put together, so we're very happy to have all of you here. Uh, the webinar has been recorded, and so there will be a YouTube recording of this, as well as the PowerPoint will be made available on the Walters Kluwer webpage uh, for AMSA. And I will send it out to everyone who has RSVP'd for this event as well. Thank you, Dr. Costanza. How about the last yeah, word? I can see so your email true. there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it up there now? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, go right I to the end there. Yep. I yeah, I that. The, yeah, I would love to hear from anybody. Don't hesitate to uh, send me an email. I get, um, I'm get i contacted by students all the time and happy to answer and um, wish you all well in, in your studies where, at whatever, you know, where, whatever level you are. Um, and uh, appreciate the invitation today. Oh, great. Our pleasure. Thank you so much for the work uh, you put uh, into this presentation and the time you spent answering all these questions. Thanks, everybody, for your great comments in the chat box, and we hope you all have a wonderful evening. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> good night. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>